we we're in that position. Right, good afternoon everyone and welcome to our first planning meeting of the committee for 2018. I do hope you've all had a very good Christmas and a happy new year. Um, celebrated well and back keen to work and I wish you all a happy, healthy and prosperous new year. Um, please be mindful to make sure you've switched off all your mobile phones um, because we are live streaming as well. Uh, as long as you've done all that, we can commence with apologies for absence, please. Uh, just two apologies here from Councillors Dovey and Murphy. Right, thank you very much. Declarations of interest? You haven't got any that you, as at the moment, thank you. So we'll go on to confirm the accuracy of the last meeting on pages 1 to 14. Um, is there any question of accuracy? Otherwise, I shall take them as read. Could, would you move? Could we have a second? Could we have a show of hands, please? Right, thank you. So we'll go now to item four of the applications for today. The first one with you, Phil, is it, please? It's yes, Co oh, it's Mark. Thank yeah. you, Mark. Coit Glass in Abergavenny, 01587. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, oh, no, no. no. Yeah, sorry, I, I should have, I, it seems to be a bit sparse in here today. Um, I'm County Councillor Ruth Edwards and I'm chairing the committee. To my right, my Vice Chair. County Councillor Peter Clark. Um, I'm Robert Trant, I'm the Legal Advisor to the Planning Committee. Philip Thomas, Development Services Manager. Mark Hand, Head of Planning, House and a Place Shape Him. Uh, Richard Williams, Democratic Services. Right, thank you all very much. Then we are, we'll continue now with Mark's... Uh, uh, application. Thank you. Many thanks, Chair. Um, a slightly unusual um, agenda item to, to kick off the new year, but this application has already been to planning committee and was approved um, for residential development of the Koi Glass site um, with a Section 106 agreement. It's being reported back today because um, following some more detailed work since that committee decision, um, Melin, who will be developing out the site um, and own the site, um, under their Now Your Home um, name um, have come up against some, some viability challenges. So there's been a lot of discussions um, over the last few months with Melin working through the details of those challenges and we've uh, taken the situation to the District Valuation Service on an open book basis um, to get their independent uh, assessment of what's proposed. So if I do a quick recap of the application um, just so uh, you're familiar what we're talking about. It's a Koi Glass site in Abergavenny. Um, used to be owned by uh, ourselves and has since been sold to Mellon Homes, now your home. Um, so it used to be occupied by these office buildings you can see on the photos, um, but they have since been demolished. It's a fairly contained site that's heavily surrounded by mature trees. And that's the aerial photo. Um, so it's uh, it is literally the area enclosed by those um, four roads, or rather the the eastern boundary closest to me is the railway, which is the dark shadow um, just next to the A four six five. And the planning permission was for fifty one dwellings um, and associated uh, highways infrastructure. Um, uh, uh, that included a mix of two, three, and four bedroom and five bedroom homes and uh, six apartments, the apartments being up in the top corner. Um, so in terms of the viability challenge, that's been to the District Valuation Service, um, and what we're asking committee to consider today is a variation to the agreed Section 106 agreements. Um, it's a fairly unusual situation, it says in the report, um, we're not obliged to agree to consider those variations. Um, there's a period after which they're signed, we could just say, no, actually, tough. Um, if it doesn't work, then don't build it. Um, but for the reasons set out in the report, we uh, we want this site to come forward, um, which I'll touch on in a minute. So the report goes through um, the viability challenge, um, 
part of which includes the district valuation services view on the amount paid for the site, but that's wholly offset by um, the level of profit the company will be taking, which is um, very, very significantly below what a market um, sector house builder would be uh, providing. Um, they've also given an opinion on bill costs, um, but Melin Now Your Home has backed that up with actual quotes, and so they've been working with us on ways of reducing those costs without actually affecting the quality of the end products and the house uh, the house types. And that's been done in a couple of ways, primarily by reducing um, the amount of land excavation, um, which keeps down the cost of the retaining walls and the lorry movements and disposing of the soil. Um, so that's, uh, that's accounted for. But the end result is um, to make the scheme stack up um, they need to drop one affordable unit, which will take it down to 17 affordable dwellings, um, which is 33%, so below our policy requirement of 35, um, albeit that that's subject to viability. And there was also just shy of £180,000 for off-site leisure contributions, um, and the proposal is that that becomes zero. Um, they can't afford that at all. So as I've mentioned, we have gone through this in detail um, full quotes for the building costs um, and all of that information shared with the district valuation service and assessed by them independently. Um, so on the basis of those recommendations, um, as officers, we recommend that the application supported. Uh, as I said, the report sets out a bit more detail. Um, it isn't an ideal scenario, but in terms of the context of this development, um, it is going to be the first uh, project delivered by Now Your Home, which is Mellon's um, delivery market housing. Um, and we think there's a, a wider benefit in making sure this is a success and then can go on both within Monmouthshire and South East Wales to deliver more housing. In effect, um, we end up with an extra house builder in the market um, rather than the current dominance of the five PLCs, which is one of our, our key challenges at the moment. Um, and, I mean, again, that's in the context of these changes being quite minimal in the grand scheme of things. So it's not an ideal scenario, but we have scrutinised it in depth. Um, I mean, you'll appreciate Melin um, didn't want to be in this position. And we've had some in-depth discussions with them um, to uh, minimise the, uh, the impact on ourselves and themselves as much as possible. Um, but with the DVS conclusions, that's why we're supporting the application. So we've got a couple of slides just to touch on the house types as well um, to reassure you they're not changing. Um, so sorry, I think that was a, a previous layout is being shown now. Um, and if you go back one, Phil, that's the, uh, that's the revised layout. This is part of a, a non-material minor amendment application. Um, the only change there is a bit of recontouring. So between in the center of the site, there's now an embankment instead of some retaining walls, which were in the realms of two meters in places. And that's because there's less cuts being undertaken. And also there were five um, bedroom houses, which are now replaced with four bedroom houses um, because the sales to build cost ratio um, is, uh, is preferable. So in terms of the house types, Oh, sorry, that's a bit of a, a site section. Apologies for the way this has come out on the presentation. Um, the detail of the plans doesn't look like that when we look at it. Um, but that shows uh, with a reduced amount of, uh, of cut sections through the site. Um, there were greater retaining walls previously. And then the house types. Again, the quality hasn't come out on the presentation, but these are unchanged um, in terms of the, the finishes, in terms of the detailing. Um, the seals and all that kind of uh, detail that committee's um, always very interested in. And this one here is the four bedroom house. There are already some of those on site and there being, there's extra of those units added in to replace the five bit unit that's now, uh, now deleted. So overall chair, we recommend uh, approval of this request to vary the section 106. Um, and the process now is the planning permission still stands. Um, but if committee agrees this, then we'll draft a new section 106 agreement as set out in the report. So with 33% affordable housing and uh, no uh, leisure contribution, and then that will be signed by the applicant and they could proceed. Um, if it's refused, um, then uh, 
I think the reality is the site wouldn't go forward at this time because it doesn't stack up commercially. Um, but that is an option to committee. Right. Thank you very much indeed for that, Mark. I believe Councillor Powell is in your award if you'd yes, like to you, address Chair. committee. Um, I mean, looking at overall, um, I'm very familiar with the area, obviously, it's in my ward. Um, it, has, it is an easy site to deal with anyway, and I think possibly the sloping rather than the slipping is actually going to lend itself better to it. I know we're going to lose one um, uh, low-cost housing, but we're having 17. And I mean, we're desperately needing houses of all sorts, and particularly uh, low-cost houses, in, in, in the, well, everywhere throughout Monmouthshire. And um, although, you know, people would say straight away, oh, we've got to keep it in two tiers. I think to have a, a firm which has got two sort of strands to it that are going to do the marketing and the low-cost housing so that they can work together, I think that it bodes well for the future. And um, we may be losing um, the 106 for um, leisure or whatever, but the thing is, it's no good having a lot of money for the leisure if people haven't got houses to live in. And I feel that uh, this is a bit of a compromise, but I can see with the costs and that that it is going to be the only viable um, situation and um, I will vote for it. Thank you very much Councillor Powell. Councillor um, Roger Harris and I'll take Councillor Feakin. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, Madam Chair. Yes my ward is uh, sort of basically uh, next door and I've read the report uh, and as Maureen has already uh, pointed out it's a it's a very complex um, site uh, and there's an awful lot of work needed to uh, to be done on it. And I can see um, now that uh, uh, it's it's started, these snags have uh, have come forward. And I have to uh, reluctantly um, agree that the district value has been uh, involved, and the uh, our social uh, housing officer has been involved, and, and reluctantly. Um, uh, come to the conclusion that t to make it viable we'll have to lose one affordable uh, uh, housing uh, unit and the uh, section 106 money but what I'm hoping is that um, if we do say yes we we uh, presumably reluctantly agree with um, uh, what is before us I note down here that um, uh, the uh, developers are uh, if you like, uh, on on or should be online for a, a 12 percent return on their uh, on their capital. If by any chance they do better than uh, that, I only hope that they're listening and will be um, uh, sympathetic to uh, uh, assuming they're going to be doing other developments of a similar uh, type sympathetic to being uh, a bit more flexible on the um, affordable housing on uh, on other sites can but hope but uh, I'd, I I'm agree with with Maureen if we turn this down goodness knows what will happen we need the houses and uh, I also will uh, be voting for this in fact I'll, I'm assuming I'll be seconding uh, Maureen's proposal thank you Councillor Harris Councillor Feakin please Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, viability is about delivering, uh, and this site will deliver 17 units, which we desperately need. Um, so I was going to second Maureen's um, uh, position, but uh, I'm happy to vote in favour of it. Um, the only one thing I would like to ask Mark very quickly is, does this set a precedence now that we've already have gone through a Section 106 agreement? Having this come back before us, does it set a precedence for other people to come back and challenge their Section 106 agreements? Um, Chair, that's that's a question that I've been really mindful of um, because I don't want to put committee in that position or myself in that position. Um, the opportunity for people to ask for this has always been there, um, so that hasn't changed. Um, I think what I've been careful to try and set out in the report um, that would make this one a yes, but not potentially um, others, is the scale of the changes on this are really slight. Um, we have gone through the DV um, with an open book system as well, which we'd expect anybody to. But there's also the added dimension of this being um, well, a way of getting this development to come forward, but with a new house builder in the market, 
um, which is an argument I don't think does present itself with any of the others. Um, no doubt other sites do have viability challenges. Um, but this is the first one for Now Your Home. So although we have to deal with viability on a site-by-site -site basis, even if they wanted to, they can't somehow financially offset this against the previous scheme because there is no previous scheme. Um, so the circumstances are different, which is why I've put forward the recommendation that, um, that I have. I think, yeah, others might come to us and ask, but I think there are differences in this case that set this one apart. Um, but I, I understand that question because I was really mindful of that. Um, both in terms of position we put ourselves in and committee because we don't want you know to start this uh, this snowballing generally speaking we wouldn't enter into these discussions and um, once the 106 is signed we don't have to do this for five years um, and they can uh, or potentially just have to mothball the site um, but in these particular circumstances we try to set out why we are supporting it um, and what the wider benefits we think are thank you for that explanation mark and as we you know, dealing with what's in front of us today. Councillor Blake, then Councillor Becker, thank you. Yeah, no, it's disappointing that there's a, a reduction in the 106 agreement. Um, I'm assuming um, the valuers have taken into account this prediction of increasing house prices as, uh, as the um, tolls disappear. Um, I mean, it was only on the news just recently saying that all the housing um, in Monmouthshire is going to be on the up and up. Have they taken that into account when looking at profit margins. And my second question, I've been asked to ask this, um, will there be uh, sprinkler systems in these homes? I know this was, uh, the process started before the change in legislation, but I was, I've just been asked to ask that question. Um, in terms of the first question around um, sales values, I, it's definitely in the district valuation services mind because I talk to them regularly in the, the officer that deals with this. Um, so they know the situation in Monmouthshire. They've done quite a lot of work with us recently. They they do have to look at it on transactions that have taken place um, in terms of the main evidence. So I'm not quite sure how it factors into the calculations as such, but they definitely know what's happening in Monmouthshire from our conversations. Um, but yeah, probably in terms of the cold hard facts they have to look at, it'll be based on recent transactions. Um, if, I was going to say in other circumstances, if we thought things were going to change that quickly, um, I was about to say we could give a shorter lifespan on the planning permission, but we can't in this case because we're just changing the 106, the permission exists. <coughs> so I'm just thinking that through. Yeah, so we can't on this. Um, and uh, the other thing I was going to mention is on, on a bigger site, we would um, be likely to factor in a, a viability review because if it was going to take several years to build out, things would change. But this site's only 50-odd houses. Um, it should be built within two years tops. So um, the market wouldn't have changed that that quickly in terms of the contracts they're running into with builders and the like. So I think there's different circumstances there would apply on different ones. Um, in terms of the sprinkler question, I'm not actually sure. I believe, and I don't know, Chair, if you're happy if I ask across to uh, the Linden who's at the back. Um, but I believe the original scheme works were put in place to implement the original permission before the sprinkler regs came in. So I'm not sure now and um, where we stand on that. Are you, are you happy if I ask across the chamber? Yes, Linden, are you happy confirming? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Happy with that, Councillor Blakebra? Yeah. Right, thank you. Just, Chair, sorry, just to clarify on that, the, um, the, the key trigger point would be the building regs application rather than planning, and yeah, that came in. Um, yeah, the application had to be in, I think, before the 1st of January 16, and works commenced before the 1st of January 17. So there's a bit of a reference in there, because it was understood that some, some works on a garage plot started. Mark. Councillor Becker, then Councillor Giles Howard. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Just a uh, <clears throat> quick word in support in my term so far on this committee i've seen viability studies used to essentially haggle uh, developers way out of their social commitment and yet even at 33 percent this is still the highest proportion i've seen 
so far. So it's still a good deal in terms of social housing and what you would expect from a developer, what developers have tried to get out of us. Uh, and if we don't encourage new developers of this nature, of this social nature, then uh, we're going to see less and less uh, social housing, not more and more. So I'm certainly in favour of it. So. Thank you very much indeed for that comment. Councillor Giles Howard. Thank you, Chair. I, I think I agree with, with Jess's comments. Um, I've, I've, I've got a, quick, a, a small query, and it's, it's, it's about the tenure of the affordable units. Um, cause I, I, with, with, with most commercial sites, the, the units are then handed over to the RSL, aren't they? In this case, I'm assuming it's a little bit different because they're actually going to be um, operated by, by Mellon themselves. Uh, I can't see any point of them developing it. So I'm, I'm just... Like a little bit more, bit more explanation about how that actually works, in that it's not the same sort of cost that, say, um, Persimmon would have to have to bear and, and, and account for uh, because they're not re retaining it, whereas as Mellon are. And I'm wondering if that makes a difference to the the, the financial picture. I mean, generally, I, I support it. And I think what Mellon are doing are, are great because obviously what they do, providing successful, will will help support their their, their the main part of their, their operation. So yeah, no problems with the principle of it, but just like a bit of detail about that. Thank you very much, Councillor. Do you want to comment on that, please, Mark, if you can? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, again, if you don't mind, if, if Lyndon can wave at me if I'm if I'm wrong. But my understanding is it's um, two arms of the same organisation, if you like. So it's now your home is the new company that's going to be building the housing, the market housing. Um, they would build, um, but then transfer the affordable to Mellon, sort of the other arm, which will do the management and the the affordable side of things so i think probably in a commercial sense the same arrangements exist the one kind of buys it off the other um is that correct yeah. Sorry. Uh, in Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Louise Brown. Um, yes, just, just really a general uh, question about um, the type of affordable housing. And I just wondered um, what the mixture was in terms of, um, you, you know, is it rental properties or is it um, uh, buying a percentage share of the equity? Because obviously affordable housing can mean different sorts of things. Thank you. Um, there's a mixed share of low cost home ownership and um, social rented. So the, the properties with the dot on are the affordable ones, uh, the blues are low cost home ownership and the reds are social rented, which, uh, which I've agreed to. Okay, okay, right, right. I believe Maureen, I don't think there's any more need for discussion. Uh, Councillor Powell, you proposed for approval, and you have a second, uh, I believe, in Roger Harris. Could I have a show of hands, please, for approval? Right. So that's unanimous. Thank you all very much on that. The next application is, uh, again, near Abgaveni, Lentilio Patholi. This is 00537 at Wernde Farm. Okay. Thank yep. you, Phil. Hazel and Oak Cottages, Wernde Farm. <coughs> So, uh, members may recall, uh, we looked at this application, but it was deferred in July. Uh, members were concerned about the lack of evidence of the marketing of the properties, <coughs> properties for holiday let purposes, which is their approved, their lawful use. The character and appearances of the properties are now considered suitable for uh, residential purposes, which is what has been applied for to change them to permanent residential. Originally, the properties prior to consent being granted um, as holiday lets, they were largely utilitarian in, in appearance um, prior to adaptation. And such properties were not allowed to be converted to permanent residential use under the, the old UDP policy H7, which has now been <coughs> superseded by LDP policy H4. So the old one H7, the new one H4. An appeal inspector back in 2010 acknowledged that since conversion to holiday let purposes, the properties now have a more traditional appearance with rendered and timber panel walls and a slate roof so that their use as dwellings would better accord with the criterion E of LDP policy H4 
than the physical appearance of the buildings would have allowed when planning permission was granted for their present tourism use. However, the inspector noted in 2010, no evidence has been supplied to demonstrate that every reasonable attempt has been made to secure such use, for example, by marketing over a sufficient period of time. Um, and as such, therefore, the present proposal does not accord with H7. So in other words, the inspector said they needed to be marketed um, when, it, when an application was made back in 2010 to change them to permanent residential. They needed to be marketed to check that the market, there wasn't demand for holiday lit units. Uh, and that, that is why the current application is, has been submitted and, and, and seeks to achieve that. Um, so we need to be assured that there's no longer a need for them as holiday lets. Um, uh, and, and it, as such, they've been marketed since uh, 2012-13 as holiday lets via normal channels. So that's the period when th th that use largely ceased. Um, and uh, since then, there's been sort of sporadic use of the properties on an occasional let basis. Um, before that, um, while they were actually operating as holiday let units between 2010 and 2000 and late on 2012, the applicant provide, has provided ev evidence that despite marketing with Sykes Cottages, they were making a significant loss when running the properties as holiday lets. For example, in 2011-12, the units were let for 108 possible days of the year and made a loss of, uh, of around £4,000. The two bedroom units, I'll just go through it, those are the two units there. The two bedroom units on the left hand side, it's slightly larger, the one bedroom on the right. The, the brick element to the left is part of a, a permanent dwelling alongside it and the properties at the back are all permanent dwellings around a courtyard as well. Um, and that's where it's located, um, near Abergavenn, east of the uh, A465. And then that's there's a sort of detailed plan. And that's where they are in, in the context of that then, uh, with their curtilages in the front uh, and parking in the front as well. So the two-bedroom unit was marketed for sale as holiday accommodation for 125000 by Christie Residential from December 2012, then Kingst Kingston Newell from uh, January 2014, then it was auctioned by Paul Fosh au Auctions in 2016, and then it was advertised on Right Move and Move Hut from March 2016. The one-bedroom unit was marketed for sale uh, for 99,950 as holiday accommod accommodation in a similar way. These values reasonably reflect a holiday let use. The council's housing officer has assessed open market value to be substantially higher, that is 170,000 for the two bedroom unit and 115,000 for the one bedroom unit for permanent residential use. So according to Kingston Newell, potential purchases were put off by the restrictions set for the holiday let use at the standard 28 days limitation of stay. Uh, and that was then extended via a subsequent planning permission to four month intervals back in 2005. But despite the continued marketing of the properties, this added flexibility did not lead to a sale for holiday let purposes. Prolonged attempts have been made to sell the units as holiday accommodation, which have been unsuccessful. Furthermore, the change of use from holiday accommodation to a permanent residential use would have minimal impact on the character of the buildings or the appearance of the wider area. It is also accepted that the units have been in existence for a significant period. The provision of two additional homes, with at least one within a first-time buyer's budget, would, would be welcomed, uh, together with the associated financial contribution of £20,000 towards affordable housing in the locality that the applicant has agreed to pay should consent be granted. And as such, the loss of the units as tourist accommodation is considered to be justified in this particular instance. So we'd recommend approval subject to the 106 agreement to secure the affordable housing contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. I think most of the committee were there on a site visit a while ago. Um, I went by there the other day and it, they have uh, improved it that the the site of it anyway. Um, I believe, is it in your ward, Roger Harris, is it or not? Can't no, it's, it's, it, it's <coughs> in um, Mardy Ward, Malcolm, Malcolm Lane, so more in an eye of the next right, two, and you could take either of us well, first. I, so. As you're in full flow then, Councillor right, Harris, okay. I'll take you um, first then, Councillor Powell, thank you. Yeah, I mean, this, this site's got a, a heck of a history. You can see it's a big site and there's all sorts of buildings uh, on there. 
Um, and uh, you know the, the planning applications we've had on this site over the years have been astronomical. But anyway, that's beside the point. You can see um, there that it's caravan site part of it, uh, and it's quite a big caravan site. Yeah, and if you if you go up the um, if you go up the road that you see just appearing off the right hand side, there's another caravan site uh, about uh, half a mile away up that road uh, and then just off there there's a, a lot of holiday uh, uh, accommodation permanent holiday uh, uh, accommodation so it's true to say there's an awful lot of holiday uh, accommodation in the area and with the caravan site there it might be uh, part of the reason why these particular units aren't uh, aren't viable uh, I reluctantly uh, have to uh, agree with the um, uh, the report. I always think it's sad if we're losing uh, holiday accommodation, but it, the report actually points out that uh, there's one eminently affordable uh, uh, unit on there for a first-time buyer, and maybe both of them uh, are one in, one in particular. Uh, as I say, it's sad that um, they will go out of the holiday uh, uh, let scenario, but uh, I can't see uh, an alternative to these <coughs> properties actually being used properly. So um, I'm happy to uh, agree with the uh, approval. Thank you very much, Councillor House. Councillor Powell, please. Yes, uh, as Councillor Harris said, you know, it's got a long history. I mean, we can both remember, and many others, when there was a, a fruit farm, not a caravan site. That, and, and it was a viable uh, business there years ago, but uh, those things have gone by the by. Um, and I think there is a lot of um, holiday accommodation in the area, and possibly uh, there's more demand for um, caravans and, and parking than there is for um, holiday lets as this. And after all, it would be two starter homes for people, wouldn't it? Like, very often people have got a job to get onto the housing ladder because of the cost of properties, but way that they could probably buy these fairly reasonable, and it would be a start step for them to go on further, and then it's a lesson there for someone else. So, I mean, they are, they are homes for somebody or other, and as we've just been talking before, we are very short of low-cost homes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we, things just have to move on. And there we are. So I, I would second Councillor Harris. Th thank you very much, Councillor Powell. Councillor Giles Howard, please. Yeah, thank, thanks, Chair. But again, I'm, I'm supportive of the application, somewhat reluctantly, but I, I, I think the, the applicant's track record there, Maureen's talked about the development from his days as a fruit farm. I remember going picking fruit out when I was, I was little. And in fact, I remember the, uh, the, it was so what they advertised in the Chronicle for people to pick rice in the paddy fields. So, yeah, the development of the golf course there, the caravans, the, the, it's, it's, it's been a significant contribution towards tourism, tourism in Abergavenny, and I guess there are occasions when businesses will try something and it, and it, and it just doesn't work, and I suspect that's, that's it in this case. The only concern I have is when we looked at the site there, all of the amenity space of, of, of each property was at the front, and it backed directly onto the yard. Um, and I, I just wonder if... The, if I can't see from the from the the, the plans that have been uh, that sent to us on on the link. But if there's anything to maintain privacy or create just a little bit of space at the back so it doesn't butt straight onto that yard, because if, you know if it's working yard, it's probably going to be quite disruptive to to some of the potential purchasers. And maybe if there's something that can be done to avoid that in the future, it might be beneficial. Yeah, sorry, just to clarify that, Giles. That courtyard is used for parking for the individuals who live in the houses in the courtyard. So it's not actually a working yard. Uh, I know those were it's very industrial, but the actual, you can see there's pub cars parked for these properties. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's very much a residential feel in there, and a communal sort of parking area feel inside there. Um, one thing that does, I, I would, would add, uh, uh, that I don't think is in the report that we should consider is actually removing permitted development rights for, for enclosures, because... Uh, um, it's, it's attractive and open at the moment. That's not to say they, they might not build some walls or something or plant some hedges around there, but we don't want a load of close boarded fences going up around the front of the attractive properties. So um, I think we should add a condition that removes permitted development rights for 
for means of enclosure, otherwise you could end up with two metre high fences going everywhere. Thank you. I fully agree with that, is what you've just uh, commented on, Phil. Uh, Councillor Alan Davis, and I'll take Councillor Brown. Thank you. Then Councillor Webb. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I mean, when we visited this site, I think the main concern was whether enough effort had been made to market the properties. I think we're all convinced now that that effort has been put in. Uh, so I certainly have no objection to the application. Uh, um, I don't think anybody seconded the approval, so I will second approval of the application. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Brown. Yes, thank you. Um, before um, before it was said, I was just thinking about uh, removal of uh, permitted development rights because one of the things I was concerned about is, um, you know, maintaining the um, parking area. And obviously, if um, if that area is used in another way to extend or whatever, there might not be sufficient parking for the. Um, so I'm, I'm totally in agreement with um, uh, the extra removal of. Uh, permitted development rights and presume that the people who've uh, approved and seconded are happy with that as well. Ollie, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, Councillor Brown. Councillor Webb? Sorry, just one thing. I mean, um, it's not a very happy situation <coughs> with that area in the front there being for washing lines, refuse, et cetera, et cetera. That's the only thing that troubles me, that it won't be a particularly um, attractive situation there. Well, thank, thank you for that comment. Yes. Um, I suppose it's, it's how they manage that themselves, really. But if we do allow means of enclosure, it, there's a way of screening that particular uh, aspect, um, you know, via hedges, possibly. But, um, uh, that, you know, inevitably, you are going to need somewhere for a bin store or, um, or, or the odd, odd washing line. But at least washing lines can be taken down, can't they? Mm -hmm. Rotary lines. Well, that, the thing is, it's quite there's, an open aspect yeah, to the road, isn't it? I mean, it? there's quite a thick hedge around there. Yeah. I think yeah. it's yeah. thrown back along here, so it's yeah. not going to be valid, but it's when much you walk into the yeah. site, really. So I think it's important that if they are going to have a washing line over this end, that there's some sort of hedge in front that isn't going to be able to soften it up a bit. Yeah. Right, so thank you. Start. Right, I believe it... Uh, Roger, did you propose uh, approval? And you second it. And also, I think uh, Councillor Davis wanted to second it. So it's well seconded. So could I have a show of hands for approval, please? <coughs> All right, thank you very much indeed, all. The next application on page 39 is 00651, and this is at Port Stewart. Um, yeah, just very short report back on this. It's been put back to members now in the light of previous concerns as a reason for refusal offered um, and uh, it's before members again for uh, now, now with a reason for refusal offered uh, in terms of uh, basis for why you're unhappy with the design of the proposed outbuilding here. Yeah. Anybody wish to comment at all? Councillor um, Clark wishes to move. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I'm quite happy to move the refusal as detailed here. And it's been seconded by. Who seconded then? Councillor uh, David Evans. Thank you very much. Could I have a show of hands for refusal, please? So that's Carrie Chairman. Right. Thank you. Thank you all very much indeed. Right. This is for information now from the inspectorate. Who wants to speak? Mark? Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Chair. Just uh, informing you of um, some appeal decisions we've had in the last uh, month or so. First one relates to uh, an unauthorised gypsy and traveller encampment at Lankaos, just up the road. Um, the matter went to appeal, and uh, our refusal of planning permission was upheld, and our enforcement notice was upheld, but an extended uh, time period for compliance was given. Um, so they've been given 12 months um, to uh, to leave the site. Um, the two key things probably that came up in the inspector's decision were around the flood risk um, and uh, around, around the uh, drainage solution that's been installed um, without permission. In terms of visual harm, the inspector wasn't persuaded and said, you know, in that context, um, some extra landscaping in the site could be okay. Uh, and also, she, from memory, she seemed persuaded that the highway safety issue um, could be addressed or have been addressed as well. Um, however, before we um, get too excited by that, just a quick heads up, we've had notification today that um, 
the app, the appellants have sought leave of, uh, to challenge that decision in the High Court. So we don't know yet if the courts will give them uh, leave to challenge, um, but I'll keep you posted on that and uh, on any final decision. Anybody else wish to comment at all on, on that? Councillor Brown? Yeah, um, and I didn't, I mean, I can't comment on the application itself because obviously I wasn't a, a, a member then, but I do know that the, I did notice that the inspector um, uh, supported TAN 15, which was to do with um, it being in a, a flood zone uh, C2 and uh, and that it's um, residential development even for caravans shouldn't be in there. And, you know, I just wanted to remind the uh, committee about my arguments in relation to a, a bridge house in Pulmeric, which was rejected by this committee. So I think if it had been refused, I think um, there's a possibility going on this decision that TAN 15 would have been followed. Thank you. Thank you, you Councillor Brown. Chair, right. um, I, I, I understand the points made. I'm, I'm not entirely persuaded. I agree. Um, I think the circumstances are different, but I guess the short version is we'll never know because um, the other one was approved. It won't be tested at appeal. Do you want to go on through the other appeals now to comment yeah, on those just, then, please, yeah, Mark? Just very briefly, on, on the Sumach or Sumach house uh, that's at Newbridge on Y. Newbridge on Earth, sorry. Newbridge on Y is not further north. Yeah, Newbridge on Earth. Uh, it's right close to the uh, to the inn there, in the middle of the hamlet, uh, as everyone knows, and there's the old bridge over the river. Um, this was for an outbuilding, so it's got a very strange looking curtilage, elongated, because they've got an access lane that leads all the way up to the house behind the pub, off the main road, so access comes in and goes all the way up there. They wanted to apply for a... Um, a garage and summer house and we were looking for it to go more much closer to the house so it's associated with the house but they wanted to put it right down here I can show you uh, right down here near the road so it was 140 meters away from the house so we had concerns about this being a sort of disparate form of development that was well not well related to the actual parent property especially as it was having uh, living accommodation like a summer house within it um, so we refused on the basis it was not in accordance with our, our guidance on extensions and outbuildings to residential properties, as it didn't relate well to the parent property. Uh, they appealed and it was allowed on appeal. The inspector looked at it really broadly in a, in, in a, in, in a, in a sort of more narrow way, really. I mean, the, the appellant had suggested that um, building it nearer the house would, would make it prone to flooding. Now, I'm not sure that was, it, that was really ever made particularly substantially, uh, and we never really went into that argument anyway. The inspector ma made reference to it in the appeal, which was slightly disappointing, because we could have, had that been an issue, we could have explored it more, uh, more closely. But anyway, I mean, that was one of the reasons stated why this was, this was perhaps a more favourable site. But then looking at it, the inspector argued that it was seen in the context of the car park and, and uh, peripheral development to the public house. So therefore, in visual terms, it wasn't harmful and it fitted in with the, with the sort of broader character of the area, regardless of its sort of functionality with the house. So it was allowed in visual terms anyway. So, um, so that was that one. Um, I don't know whether members have got any comments on that. Anybody wish to comment on that, Councillor Blakeborough? Okay, quick question. Um, do, the inspectors actually come, uh, do the inspectors always come out on site when they look... Oh, it's okay. Yes. Yeah. At least they do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and normally, when we're looking at... Uh, on that point of flooding, normally when, when you're looking at extensions to properties, which are already in a flood zone, NRW won't object to them because it's... Uh, basically, the risk is already stuff, there. Yeah. Um, so all you're doing is sort of just extending something which may, may or may not flood in the future anyway, and that's the risk that the applicant takes in, in seeking to make their home a more attractive place. Um, so we were slightly disappointed, really, with the reference to that in the appeal decision. But there we are. Um, we have to live with that one. Uh, and then the last one was at Wincliffe uh, Court, which is a Grade 2 star listed arts and crafts building there, very attractive, as you can see. It's got stone, limestone... Uh, stone slates, Collie Western Stone, which is uh, an, an area I'm familiar with because I grew up near there in Northamptonshire, um, and it's used here on this particular property. The applicant wanted to use a, a, an albeit a good, a good artificial slate to replace these because uh, they are deteriorating. Um, 
uh, because of the emphasis of the arts and crafts on use of natural materials, the, 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 the emphasis on fine quality workmanship, the inspector agreed with the officers that uh, to use an artificial slate would, would be harmful to the character of the listed arts and crafts building in this instance. So uh, the appeal was dismissed on that basis. Um, and there was no evidence to, to say how good the weathering would have been on the new product, newer product anyway, because it hadn't, it hadn't existed long enough to, for, for the product to be sort of looked at over that, that period in terms of its weathering qualities and how it would look. So that was that one. So that was... Uh, quite a pleasing one to win in, the, in that there was quite a lot of criticism of our heritage team and the approach they took on that one. Right. Th thank you, Councillor Webb. Can I just say I'm really, really pleased um, with this decision too. And um, could you convey my thanks to Amy, who's spent a lot, a lot of time on this um, application, a huge amount of time. And I um, think the inspector has come to the right decision and I appreciate his report, which is quite uh, clear. Thank thanks, thank Councillor Webb. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's all the appeals then? Yeah, and there's just to mention the appeals that have been received. Yeah. And you've got a list in, at the back there. Yeah. I believe that members can sit in on appeals or hearings yeah. if they so wish, if, if anybody yeah. wanted to do that. It does uh, prove very interesting sometimes as well. Right. Um, Sorry? This is the last report on the enhanced services. Yes. Um, I'm just, is Mark going to do that or? No, I'll do that. Oh, you're going to do it. Yeah. Right. Item six yeah. then on the agenda, the enhancement service proposals. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, this report seeks planning committee's endorsement for a proposal to charge additional fees for an enhanced level of customer service for additional uh, development management services. The proposals seek to raise additional income to address, address financial pressures and are in response to the increasing market demands to become more efficient and timely in providing constructive advice. In seeking to develop these services, the evidence base and business case to support the structure is set out in this report. The proposals seek flexibility to roll out additional services when possible, building on the success of the recently piloted Fast Track Householder application service, as well as other additional services now offered. Monmouthshire has been offering a bespoke formal pre-application advice service since April 2014, and it's been well received by both customers and staff. The existing service that has been running successfully um, was developed by engaging with our customers um, and asking them what matters. Uh, we discovered that, most importantly, applicants wanted consistency and clarity in advice, speed in decision-making, and to maintain an open dialogue with their case officer. The pre-application uh, advice service has been fine-tuned over the last 12 months, offering additional services, resulting in the development of a fast-track system where applications could be dealt with more quickly for an additional fee. This was introduced in part following single cabinet member approval in April 2017. Under these changes, a fast-track system is available to what we call Level 3 and 4 pre-application advice requests. Those are the more complex and more, uh, normally uh, larger-scale developments. They can also be used for householder planning applications, certificates of lawfulness and applications for listed building consent where they accompany a householder planning application. And at this point, it was considered sensible to trial a limited range of services to understand what could be achieved and what the resource implications would be. From this trial, we have gathered valuable data and evidence to provide confidence in rolling out the fast track options to other services. The fast track services have been well received, especially in relation to householder applications. Uh, and by mid-December 2017, we'd received 23 requests amounting to almost £2,000 in additional fee income. To date, only one application has missed the fast track deadline of 28 days instead of the standard 56. And this was due to the applica application being called to planning committee for a decision. <laughs> no criticism intended. Uh, since offering these additional services, uh, we've received requests for additional types of applications to be fast tracked. For example, minor planning applications such as new shop fronts and listed building consent applications too. In order to match this demand and provide a service that suits the customer, it is proposed as part of this report to offer most services with a fast track option. As and when resources allow, and I would emphasize that, the additional fast track services can be offered to the customer meeting their individual needs. In addition, this would help facilitate a wider assessment of the demand for enhanced services 
allowing a better and more accurate forecasting of fee income. However, for major and more significant development proposals, the statutory eight-week period is rarely realistic, although customers can seek some certainty regarding timely decision-making. This can be secured by the applicant and the local planning authority entering into a, what we call a planning performance agreement, or PPA, uh, for an agreed fee. This would normally relate to proposals for larger residential, retail or industrial projects, uh, or leisure projects. This voluntary agreement would vary depending on the proposed development, but it would set out agreed timescales and agreed fees for processing applications. It should cover the pre-application, application and possibly post-application stages of the development, encouraging joint working with the local authority and the <coughs> applicant. Other authorities in South East Wales already offer this form of PPA, um, and they include Cardiff and Rondhakan and Taff. It should be noted that all of the additional fees referred to relate to certainty of timescale, not a guaranteed outcome, i.e. we can't guarantee that the actual proposal would get planning permission. It may be unacceptable. In addition, in addition to offering fast-track services for more application types, it's proposed to include a fast-track service for discharging conditions on planning and listed building consent applications. These applications seek to degree, uh, agree details of elements of the proposed uh, proposal, of the approved proposal, sorry. For example, drainage details, window details, or materials. There is currently a statutory fee for this service where it relates to a planning application, but not where it relates to a listed building consent application. So therefore, this would be a new charge in terms of listed building consent, discharge of condition applications. The proposed fees are set out in the appendix to this report. The enhanced service fees have been set on the basis that there's a 50% increase in the normal fee to deliver the service in a reduced time, time scale and to make this transparent and fair across the spectrum. As with the current system, if the time scale is not met and a short extension of time is not then agreed by the applicant, the additional fast track element of the fee is returned to the applicant. The remainder of the fee is a statutory fee and is not refundable. It's important to note that the statutory services will not uh, be affected by, you know, the normal service, uh, eight week ser service, etc., will not be affected by the offer of enhanced provisions. The target to meet the eight week target, um, sorry, the eight week target for 80% of applications uh, to be determined within, within eight weeks is still a key priority for the department and will continue to be monitored and managed closely. In addition to the above, Cabinet member approval will be sought to raise the proposed pre-application of fast-track fees in line with any Welsh Government increases in the statutory application fees. And the proposed fast-track fees are set at 50% increase, as I've said, in the, in the standard fee, and therefore the proposed increase will remain proportional if, if, when it, whenever it is increased. And this is in order to future-proof the service and ensure that the offer can react in an appropriate and positive manner. There may be some initial challenges in resourcing the enhanced services, for, especially for larger applications, but the intention of this report is to future-proof the service, providing the fast-track option as and when we can resource it and the customer requ requests it. The trial period has been successful for householder applications, but the demand for larger scale applications is still somewhat unknown. However, having the option to provide these services will give the planning service flexibility. And indeed, the additional fees offered by the Fast Track and Planning Performance Agreement services may mean we can employ an additional <coughs> officer or officers to meet this demand as and when it arises. And as, as is the norm, the, this enhanced offer will be under regular review. So members, as I've said, are respectfully requested to endorse these proposals for subsequent consideration and hopefully authorisation by the Cabinet Member for Enterprise. Um, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Councillor Blakeborough, then I'll take Councillor Becker. Thank you. Then Councillor Brown. Oh, thanks. Um, first of all, the pre-application advice service, I think, is a success. I think it's worked really, really well. Um, and uh, it's a very efficient service. Um, with the introduction of the fast track service, I can see where you're going with it. My concern, I guess, is this creation of a two-tier service. If you've got the money, you're going to get quality service. If you haven't got the money, second class. Um, so I need assurance that will not happen. Um, I'm also, um, and you've started answering my question there, really, 
But um, I guess it's how confident are you that the increase in demand for the fast track service will not uh, detract um, any resources <coughs> from the mainstream service delivery? Um, but I think you're saying that actually you're ensuring that the mainstream is priority and as the demand increases and the money comes in, it's then you will then start employing people to fill that gap. So really just absolute assurance that we don't get this two-tier effect and be accused by residents that, oh, blimey, if you've got the money, you're in there, you're going to get a good service, and that's what we want to ensure doesn't happen, really. Thank you, Councillor Blake. Right, Councillor Backer, please. Same concern. Don't want it to become, uh, you know, a privilege of the wealthy oh, at the expense of the ordinary. But I think also uh, scrutiny on what happens with the scheme going forward is going to be very important because I know that we can't actually tell what that impact will be until we know the levels at which the service is used. Um, I think it's also important to say at this stage, just because we have a minimum target of what should be uh, reviewed within eight weeks, you know, it could impact the system so that we're not. We're still above that minimum target, but it is impacting uh, what we're doing, you know. And I think that there is, you know, there's there's an element there that we need to look at in scrutiny as well. I'm all for it because I like the idea of innovating in the system and keeping it future proof. But um, just as long as we watch our backs. So. Thank you, Councillor. So, Councillor Louise Brown, now please. Then, then Councillor Webb, then Councillor Giles. Uh, right. Yeah, um, I was just looking at the um, table in terms of um, proposed changes from the first of December. Um, and it does actually um, say in one, I mean, most of it clarifies exactly what the increases are proposed to be. But in new dwellings, it says one to nine dwellings only, varies eight weeks, 50% increase in fee, 42 days. And then non-residential floor space, eight weeks, 50% varies. Now, um, I think there's a difference between, say, for example, one new dwelling and nine new dwellings so it would be useful i mean if you if you got somebody who's just um building one house i mean obviously it'd be useful to know um what exactly the fee was for that because obviously somebody who is in a position to build nine dwellings has obviously got a bit more wherewithal than somebody on just one and the this table doesn't give any indication of what the fees are thank you Right, thank you. I think Mark has got an explanation for you now, Councillor. Yeah, Chair's a few really good points. Uh, so thank you. I suppose um, one of the really exciting things about working here is we are allowed to try this stuff out, um, which has worked with a householder, but yeah, the culture here lets us try it, and if it doesn't work, um, and part of the definition of whether it works or not will be in liaison with yourselves, um, then, uh, then we can stop it. Um, so yeah, as Phil said, what we're after is... Um, comments to cabinet member but it's just to have this in place i think certainly with the planning performance agreements we'd look to roll that out because that's something we can definitely benefit from straight away um some of these other proposals will be ones we'll keep up our sleeves um as and when demand arises and we can deliver it so we absolutely want to be clear we don't end up with people being disadvantaged i suppose we do need to be a bit honest though that i mean we're not looking to create a two-tier system but if someone is paying more for a faster service then they should be getting a faster service. Um, and yeah, there are some difficult things around that, I suppose, in terms of wealth and privilege. I suppose we did, I just cover that we did We did look at this in terms of are we really significantly disadvantaging people, but the level of the fees are really a fraction of what people are spending on the development. And by definition, if they're applying to extend their house or build a house, etc., they have got a little bit of money behind them. Um, so I understand what you're saying, but I don't want to tell you that it isn't a complete two-tier system because there is an element of that, if we're honest. Um, I don't want to sort of mislead you. Um, in terms of Councillor Brown's um, specific question, the reason it says varies is um, the fee for one dwelling is £380 for an application, so it would be 50% on top of that. Um, and then the fee actually for the project changes. And the same with um, commercial builds the fee is based on either the floor area or the site area. Um, but the the statutory fee is explicit in the regs based on those things, so the customer knows what they're paying, and then this would be 50% on top of that. But if we actually do, well, it would be impossible to do a table of every scenario for every different floor area permutation. 
um, but they are clear if that makes sense. So we can show you um, a link which sets out what the statutory fees are, and it's based on you know an amount per um, number of dwellings or an amount per square footage, um, square meters rather. Um, but yeah, it'd be impossible to properly detail all that on a table. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want to come back to you, Councillor? Yeah, I just thought, um, uh, uh, basically, um, what was uh, said um, just then, um, it was just really a question of whether or not there was a bre breakdown in terms of new dwellings. So, in other words, it said one dwelling, two dwellings, three, just to give us an idea, because you know you you've got no idea i mean obviously it's useful you've told me what it would be for one dwelling but it's just that if we're asked to look at this it's nice to know what what the actual changes are on the rest of the table does actually provide those uh, changes thank you okay Chair. in terms of dwellings the, f the starting point's easy it's 380 pounds per dwelling um when you get to bigger schemes I think it's over 50 so it's 380 per dwelling when you get to 50 it's £16,464 or something like that, it used to be, and then plus about £85 per dwelling above. Yeah, and then up to a maximum. I think the maximum fee is now just over £250,000, yeah. um, but we never get anywhere near that, sadly. Um, <laughs> no, 350 sorry, 380 is the original cost. So it'd be 5 So it'd be 5 what, 520 five. Yeah. yeah, about 520. Uh, oh, I see. Well, that, well that's it. at least that shows it's a proportionate one. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I believe I've got Councillor Webb next. Thank you. Thank you. I don't like the word discrimination against the um, less well-off use because I'm sure this hardly covers the cost of the work that our planning department actually do, even with these costs, and that really does concern me. Um, but um, I just wanted to make that point. Thank you very much. And could I come in with regard to the previous, um, the new appeals um, decisions? No, on the previous applications, right. please, okay. in a minute. Yes, okay. Um, I, uh, I believe then it's Councillor Howard next, please. Thank you. I, I, I support the report and the proposals within it. I, I think any any notions we have of a two-tier two system, uh, we need to think about who it is who's going to benefit from it. We're not talking about a, a health service where you can spend a bit more and get better treatment or send your, send your children to a better school. Most of the people who are going to be paying these fees are seasoned business people who are doing commercial projects. And it may be for their convenience as well, if they've got builders or or if they've got a team of staff who they need to portion to a job at a particular time, that might fit with their needs. Ultimately, if they don't want to, to, to pay it, they, they don't have to. Um, I, I do think looking at some of the, the, the smaller fees, the NMAs and the, and the conditions, it's, uh, it's almost a little bit of a cheek for, to ask for a little bit more for a, quite, a, quite a small job, and they can be dealt with on pretty tight timescales anyway. I mean, you're talking about approving materials for something, that's just an email, isn't it? charging somebody an extra couple of quid for do it within two weeks, I think it's a bit a bit much. But the, I, I think what I'd like some um, assurance about is, is, is the matter of quality. And say, for example, you had somebody wanted to develop a, a new or a pair of dwellings on a site that hadn't benefited from, from pre-app, whether normal or, or enhanced. But what happens then if they put in a fast-track application for those dwellings, and yet we think they're that they're probably not very good. You've, you've limited yourself to a, a, a very tight time scale then to, to try and deal with that and to try and se seek any improvement. So what I'd hate for us to get to is for us to start letting through development that we'd probably rather not, um, but we don't want to lose the, the fee and it's not so bad that we can, we can refuse it because it'll go through on appeal. Thank you for that, Jos. I was thinking myself about the health service and, and how you could pay to get it done sooner or whatever, but then that's a different issue, really. But I wouldn't want anybody to think, because you've got the wording fast track, that you can assume that you're going to get it agreed, because every application has got to be looked at and all of it takes time. So I'll leave it to Mark to give more explanation. Yeah, Chair, I really welcome that question, because it is really important yeah. to stress. Um, our priority here, and we do keep banging on about it, isn't about the speed, it's about the outcome. So if we have one of those examples that, that um, Councillor Howard suggested, um, I would say just refund the extra fee. And if it takes us longer <laughs> to negotiate something better, then that's what we'll do. Um, although we, we slightly jokingly mentioned the one that we missed on the householder trial um, because it came to committee, that's just part of the process. So we're not going to try and stop that or change that. Um, if that's what happens and needs to happen, then that's what will happen. But yeah, absolutely. 
I mean, the, the extra fees, it's, it's, a, it's a bonus to us, if you like. Um, it's something that we would like and we need financially. Um, but, yeah, the outcome is going to be there for a lot longer than a couple of hundred pounds. So the focus is on the outcome. Um, in terms of, really briefly, sorry, Chair, in terms of, sort of monitoring the success, which is something Councillor Becker mentioned, um, we have to put in an extra bit in the reports now, looking at what success is and how we'll monitor it. So what we're proposing is we'll report on it as part of the annual performance reports that we already do. Um, we already take it to Economy and Development Select and Planning Committee is invited to that meeting. Um, so we could do it in that fashion if you're happy with that approach, rather than trying to report on two things separately. But as we go, um, welcome your feedback onto how you think it's working. At the moment, the household of Fast Track probably doesn't really impact on you that much as, as ward members or as, as committee members. But if slightly bigger projects become involved, <coughs> um, you probably would get involved as a ward member. So we'll uh, do some learning with you as it goes and see how it, how it works for you or otherwise. Thank you very much, Mark. I've got Debbie, <coughs> then Roger, and then Matthew. <coughs> All councillors, please. <laughs> Councillor Blakeborough. Thanks, Chair. Um, just um, two, I suppose, fairly generic uh, questions. Um, what other authorities have a fast track system? Are there any other authorities that have this uh, system? And how do our fees compare to other authorities' fees? Yeah, I know Wrexham do householder service, but I couldn't actually honestly tell you, perhaps John, uh, Councillor Howard will uh, tell us. I know um, they do planning performance agreements on a much larger scale for larger projects. Um, Cardiff obviously have to do planning performance agreements because they've got big schemes, so they, it's, uh, with you know the lead-in time developers want to have some certainty as to when it's going to go to committee. Um, <coughs> Ron, they're going to for doing something similar. Um, but again, they've probably got bigger sites. Some of their housing sites are quite a bit bigger than ours. Um, so we're, we're going to meet them and learn how they, how they handle those and try and learn from them to see what the pitfalls are, what works well for them. Um, in terms of fast track on less, you know, smaller applications. Wrexham, yeah, start, certainly started in the household. Were they extending it to uh, minor apps as well, yeah? Sorry. Yeah, I believe colleagues in Wrexham, they, they were doing householder, so we got some hints from them for our service. Um, and I gather recently they were talking about starting sort of minor commercial type developments, um, which is partly where some of our conversation flags up to see what else we could do. In terms of cost? Um, I'm not actually sure. No, there was some rationale that went into the householder um, approach, and I think that looked at what Wrexham um, was doing. Um, but we also had to try and pitch it. You know, we didn't want to make it so expensive it wasn't worthwhile anyone doing. Um, we don't want to make it so cheap it wasn't worthwhile us doing. Um, and also, I suppose, try and learn. You know, why why would someone pay for that extra service? What do they actually want? What makes it work? Yeah, what makes it financially or in any other sense worthwhile? Um, so, again, this will be a, another step in that learning curve. We haven't really had anything to benchmark ourselves against on that. We've yeah. kept with the same approach. Um, it might well be that those fees or those timescales aren't realistic, and we need to reflect them um, or or change them. But you know, hopefully, with this agreement, we can just carry on with that as as so needs dictate. Yeah, the, the baseline fees are statutory fees set by Walsh government. Um, right. Councillor Harris. Sorry, just on that, they don't put them up every year. Uh, the last rise was in 2015, but prior to that, I think the rise was in 2009. Salaries haven't got up. Why do you run that? Councillor Harris, then Councillor Feakin, and then Councillor Brett. Thank you, uh, Chair. I'm just looking for some clarity on the Level 2 proposed uh, changes. It's got 250 statutory, 120 bespoke, and then the fast track 240. I can't make any sense of that. Are, are they right or? Yeah. So um, 
for, for pre-application advice, there's there's a statutory uh, service that the Welsh Government expect you to provide to, if a developer comes, applies via the statutory service, and then we do our own Monmouthshire bespoke one. Now, um, level two is normally small plots, you know, two, three dwellings, yeah. um, and um, it's set at, by the Welsh Government at £250. So we've, in the past, we started doing it, and we, we set it at 120 and we didn't change that because we think our service is better uh, and it actually undercuts the Welsh Government service, even though it's better. But we get a lot of level two, so we thought if we put it up substantially, then we'd, we'd get fewer of them. Um, the, the statutory service doesn't even involve a site visit, for instance. You don't go and look at it on site. You don't necessarily meet the developer. You do a desktop study of it and send it back to the developer. So uh, we don't get many statutory ones, um, as you can imagine, because a good planning agent could do all of that work themselves by looking at the development plan online, working out uh, from SPG what the Section 106 agreements would require and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, sort of just generally doing the work themselves, the homework themselves. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, there is, might be a case for putting up that level twos, so I don't know, because it is quite, quite, quite below the statutory service. So the fast track would be twice the um, twice the uh, the bespoke ser you know the existing bespoke service for a level two. So um, so can but I it would still be below the uh, the statutory service. Right? Can I take it? Anyone would be crazy to use the statutory uh, service if they can get it less than half price. Um, I'm not sure really why a customer would use it. Um, it is it is a quite a different quite a different service yeah and in effect as phil mentioned you get a bit of a site history a bit of a policy background and essentially that's it but you could do that for yourself or an agent would do that themselves um so the service that we offer is is way above that we haven't had many many requests since it came in um but it, it was partly introduced um because historically not everybody offered pre-app so the welsh government you know said that you have to offer the service and this is the mandatory one um, I think by the time it came in, almost everybody was doing it. Um, but that's just one of those things. And again, I think they probably set the fees because they asked us what we were charging for pre-app um, and then based the uh, mandatory fees on that, even though it's for a lesser service. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not really sure why you're coming for the statutory one, to be honest. <coughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Feakin and then Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think we can be quite ambitious with our... Um, planning performance agreements um, for our agreement so for example a million pound costs roughly five grand a month to maintain um, so a four million pound development you're talking um, 20 grand a month so if we can shorten that timeline for a developer by a month we're saving them 20 grand uh, so that is significant um, the only thing the only caveat with that be I think the only thing we need to be mindful of that they don't then use that 20 grand against their or within their viability assessment to um, deride their affordable housing contributions. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to comment or not? No, not by the look of it, I thank uh, you. No, I, I agree. Uh, that would be rather a perverse outcome. <laughs> right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Brown. Yeah, it's just um, looking again at the proposed changes from the 1st of December 2015. We've got current fee and time scale, and then we've got fast track proposed fee and time scale. What, what I want to know is, is do, does the current fee and time scale relate to fast track, current fast track things, or does it relate to normal householder applications? So, for example, if we've got somebody applying for a new dwelling of an application for one dwelling only, um, if they apply on the normal basis, how much will it cost? And obviously on the new basis, you've said it's going to cost um, 520 for a, a fast track. So it's really just an explanation of exactly what this um, table means, because unless we can put that into perspective, I would like to know is if, for example, I apply as a householder and I'm not going through fast track, how much do I have to, just for one one dwelling, how much do I have to pay and how long will it take? And how much, if I go for fast track, would I have to pay and how long would it take? You know, and I'm just a little bit confused about what the table means. Thank you. Um, there's, there's a difference between um, a householder application and applying for a house. Um, so a householder application is extending your house or building a garage in your garden. Um, so the statutory service is £190. We have eight weeks to do it. 
um, after whichever right of appeal. The fast track is an extra £85, so 275 and we uh, our target is 28 days instead of eight weeks, so four weeks instead of eight weeks. Um, for um, a new dwelling, when we come to rolling that out, um, a single dwelling, so just building one new dwelling, is 380 and again, eight weeks. And we're proposing um, it'd be 570, not 520, as I said earlier. Yeah, so 570 is 50% extra and 42 days, so six weeks. <coughs> So could I just clarify, so presumably somebody, if they wanted to, could go along on the normal system and get the number of normal number of weeks or go on the other one and pay a bit more to get a fast track. That's right, is yeah, it? Yes. Yeah. And the table in the left-hand column is really for those who are non-fast track then, is it? The, the middle column is setting out the current situation, so the statutory fee and the the current time scale. So, so that's for those who aren't going on the fast track thing, and that will remain the same after the 1st of December, will it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I you, see. You so, can ignore so, the 1st of December date. So when, day, it, when it says current fee and time scale, what it actually means is current fee and time scale for non-fast track applications. Yeah. This, is, this is why I was a bit confused yeah. by this table. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll take Councillor Webb now, who might wish to come back with Thank one of the appeals. Thanks Webb. for allowing me to come back. I, I've missed this. On the um, new appeals list, I'm just a bit concerned about DC 2017-00524, because although it says Lannan and Farm Trellick Grange, the actual barn is in um, Debbie's ward, in um, Trellick United ward, although this would indicate that it's in my ward. And I just want it um, really recorded that... Um, it's in, you understand what I'm trying to say, don't you? I think the chairman understands. Um, the, yeah. It's the been residents. listed as an appeal um, as part of that farm, but the actual building that it refers to is in another ward. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that you were, right. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's like having a residence, yeah. especially yeah. farming-wise, and yeah. it can be spread over a couple mm. of different yeah. branches. Yeah, it, it depends how they've described it on the appeal form, the appellant or the appellant's agent. So. And, and the, the planning inspector will repeat that, and then we'll take the information that they've given us and put that in the. Uh, Thank you. In the. Yeah. I'm I'm Thank glad you. you've Thank highlighted you. that because we had an appeal in my ward, um, at Rockfield Village, and on the appeal it was Grosmont Mill. Millhouse Grosmont, yeah. and it was very confusing because a lot of the local people didn't think it had anything to do with them, so they didn't make representation. So it can be confusing if the address isn't right. Thank you very much. Just a reminder, there's training before the next planning committee in the morning. Oh, yes. Design. Design, yeah. Agenda will be issued shortly. Oh, right. I'll come and have a look. Yeah, I'll come on that.